Pila. Probably Pila right. wash it down. Yeah. Well. All right, good morning everyone. Sorry we're we're running a little behind. We have habits so uh that's fine over here too. Technical All right. <laughs> So if all of a sudden everything goes yeah. snowy. I mean like really this you look up there and it's snowy. Just be patient. We'll get worked out. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pray for us while Dylan's kind of fixing up the rest of this stuff. Something's wrong with the screen, so the words. And hopefully, you run your spectacles and you can read that because we don't have time to fix it right now because we want to get going. Uh, Mr. Dwayne is going to be sharing God's word with us this morning, and so you guys get a break from so listening to me holler, which is good because I. I should be good by next week, so it's going to get loud. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy. Uh, thank you for uh, your subtle reminders of our humanness. And thank you that we don't really need anything except for your word and hearts willing to worship you. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that you would lead us into that and that uh, as Dylan and Darren lead us in song that we would sing out heartily and sing out to you for your glory, for your kingdom. I pray that you would bless the way this morning as he you brings your word and that we would receive it with open and soft hearts. Praise your most precious name, Jesus. Stand up with us. We'll be right in a second. So, God reminds us every morning that we are human, and this morning he says, Dylan, you're not so good at tech as you think you are sometimes. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, we can just stand and worship him and give him all the glory because uh, it's not us. Um, but he did fix the screen, so thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right, we're going to start this morning with Great I Am. Uh, it's an oldie, but a goodie. So.
If you bow your heads and pray with us. Heavenly Father, thank you for another wonderful day. Lord God, we just can't thank you for all the blessings you pour out upon each and every one of us. Lord God, even though sometimes we're going through struggles, it's a blessing because uh, you know better than us. Each struggle that we go through each and every day has a reason. It has a purpose. And uh, even though we might not know it, Lord, that you do and that you guide us through it and that we follow you and we can be more like you each and every day, Lord. Lord, we just can't thank you enough for all the things that you've poured out upon our uh, upon your people, Lord. And we just thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.
for this gorgeous day and all these people gathered together to worship your name through the good and the bad and the easy and the rough. I thank you for being there and being our hope through it all. And I just ask you to have your hand over Mr. Duane as he comes up and gives us a message and that we will let that um, work in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name. Check, check, check. Test, 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 test. Woo! There we go. Good, thank you. Thanks, Theron. Thanks, Dylan. Thank Rowan for helping uh, lead us in worship with song. And I, I pray that uh, just carries over here with uh, worship in your word. We're in 2 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 11 and we'll just dive right into it let's get started Paul starts by saying I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness do bear with me and um, this foolishness he talks about is is a boasting when we go back up a, a verse in the um, former chapter here um, or Two verses, verse 17, uh, chapter 10. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. So that he's at this point writing to the Corinthian church as far as, you know, it's foolishness for me to talk about myself. Um, he echoes this time and time again in 1 Corinthians as his first letter there, he says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Um, he's mentioned that uh, he considers everything that about him and his past you know, accomplishments, he counts it all as rubbish in comparison um, to the Lord. If he's going to boast in anything, it's going to be the cross. So why now? So why now is he, he taking the time to, um, to talk about this foolishness? It's, you know, the focus of this boasting. Um, he says that uh, this boasting is not in himself, but it's what God has done. And he's trying to remind them. He's also, he's combating um, the Judaizers, Judaizers who have come in and they've been promoting themselves and, and talking Paul down. And he's, he's like, you've put me in this position where I need to talk about, you know, what has happened. And so because of being forced into it, I'm going to remind you of it. Second verse, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to, pre to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Maybe your translation says uh, a godly jealousy. And uh, we... We tend not to think of, you know, that emotion as being a, a holy thing, a godly type thing, you know, described as a green-eyed monster. But again, where's the focus that is? We, we see that God describes himself that he is a jealous God. He's jealous for us. He's jealous for um, it, the country of Israel, his people set aside that... Um, you know, when they've turned away from him time and time to idols, he's described it as far as, you know, this is my bride who's turned away and, 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 and I'm jealous for you and, and turn back to me. The second part of uh, verse there is, I promised you, uh, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul is putting himself in place of a, a father. In the Jewish um, tradition, uh, marriages were arranged, sometimes from very, very young, you know, toddlers, as far as you may have a, 
uh, uh, friends that you're, you know, you're tight with, and and I have a boy, and and you have a girl, and who better? Let's let's make arrangements for them to be married. Well, so then they're engaged, basically, from a, a very young age. Now the betrothal um, process comes later. Typically, they um, would say it would be like a year before the actual celebration of the the marriage. And during this betrothal, it was just as binding as a marriage, you know. And and that's what we read about when uh, uh, with Joseph and Mary, where Mary was conceived um, by the Holy Spirit, and and Joseph when he was found out about it, they were still through the betrothal process in their relationship. And so he was seeking to put her away quietly. It would require a divorce certificate. And here, you know, that uh, Paul is claiming the role of the as far as I've selected you to be married um, to Christ. Um, There's there's one kind of thing you know i've been it may not sound it right now i'm a little stuttering or whatever and hopefully i settle in but you know i've been reading this for quite some time and it's amazing every time you know you read through scriptures it's nothing new something something hits you but did you ever think about the gospel being shared was was given with the vision of you being the bride given to Christ. I mean, typically we, we look at the gospel and we see it as it's, it's your salvation, it's forgiveness of sin, and it is all that. But just something that we kind of forget, you know, it's all about me and what I've re- I'm receiving and, and it's very humbling and, and, and our, you know, as far as our, our desire to go out and, and share, but there's another aspect as far as the gospel was given to you that you may be given to Christ. And when it talks, you know, about uh, you being a bride, women, you know, hopefully I'm not being stereotypical, but, you know, women are pretty cool with that, you know, as far as being the bride. And and guys, you, you I know when I was younger, kind of freaks you out a little bit. You think about a bride that just seems kind of weird. And you know what? Stay in God's word. Keep reading that. Trust me, you're going to come around to, you know, a love for the Lord. You're going to get over that kind of freakiness about being a bride, you know, to the Lord and Savior. So I encourage you there. All right, keep reading. Verse 3, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So deceived Eve by his, his cunning. Now, if Satan is looking to deceive, it, it is by a fraction that, it, that it's going to happen. Chances are, if there's some way blown, you know, big, you know, um, heresy, you're going to recognize it and you're going to, you know, shield away from it. But, you know, it's by these little, little degrees. And uh, and see what happens here. Last time I kind of brought a secular uh, portion into the sermon. We had, a, we had a failure in the sound system. And <laughs> so far, so good. All right, I'm going to read some lyrics here. Now, many, many years ago, when I was 23... I was married to a widow who was pretty as could be. This widow had a grown-up daughter, had hair of red. My father fell in love with her, and soon the two were wed. This made my dad my son-in-law and changed my very life. My daughter was my mother because she was my father's wife. To complicate the matters, even though it brought me joy, I soon became the father of a bouncing baby boy. My little baby then became a brother-in-law to dad and so became my uncle, though it made me very sad. For if he was my uncle, that also made him the brother of the widow's grown-up daughter, who of course was my stepmother. I'm my own grandpa. (laughs) 
from the gospel of Willie Nelson. <laughs> no, but uh, it, you, so you end up with this outrageous thing, but it, it starts in little degrees, little kind of thing that it can be fabricated. And, and spiritually, uh, you know, talks about here, uh, um, maybe I should move on to verse 4. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily. So another Jesus, a different spirit, spirit, a different gospel, um, you put up with it readily enough. That not that a sad thing to say about a, a body of believers that, you know, they would be so easily deceived? And, and I pray that that's, that's never to be said about us. Um, it, there's claims that, uh, well, Jesus was just a great teacher. There's heresies that... Uh, that abound. Some are that uh, he was just a spirit. He only seemed to be human. His human form was an illusion. If he walked along the beach, he wouldn't leave footprints in the sand. Um, and those, those seem uh, kind of crazy, but let's bring it to some heresies that, that continue on today as far as God is love. I mean, there's no denying God is love. But God is also just. He's jealous. He, he, he just focusing on one aspect, just reaching into Scripture and grabbing one little bit, can be creating a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit. It was prob- It was less than ten years ago that. Uh, I had a couple of Mormons knock on my door at home and uh, and I, I entertained them to, to be able to come in and, and talk to me and uh, on the grounds that any discussion that we had were based on uh, the Bible, the Bible that I had, God's Word. They agreed that... Uh, the Bible was God's, you know, breathed word. They had their additional, you know, material that they had, but uh, the discussion was to come out of here, and and it, it went for a little bit and rescheduled for a second time. And whether that was wise or not, you know, actually, when you, you know, you read uh, James, I believe, no, it's John. He's like, don't do it. If, you, if there's someone coming, you know, with, a, with another gospel, don't even accept them into your house. But I, I did. I opened the house to them. And um, you know what? They were all very cordial. And, you know, we had discussions back and forth about uh, um, verses. But you know when they were offended? They wanted to give me the Book of Mormon. And I told them, no, I wouldn't be able to take it. And they said, well, why not? And I said, this is another gospel. And the word of God warns me against taking it. Now, you know, there was part of me that going, well, you know, I'll take it. And I'll be able to read it. And I'll be able to use it against, you know, any kind of, I'll be just that more educated on how I can, you know, speak against this. But I didn't, I didn't even want to take it into my hands. They got ugly. They did, and they, they got up and they left. Um, so guard your heart, guard your mind against that. It, it's um, a couple uh, chapters ago, it said, take every thought captive to Christ. And so then that's what it is. You know, when you know, your mind is open and receiving information, you know, throughout the your day, your week, you know, maybe it's coming from television or radio or your coworkers, and, you know, take that opportunity to grab thoughts captive and bring them before Christ rather than entertaining and mulling over in your mind. I know my mind's only got limited, uh, limited power and limited capacity. And quite honestly, there, there's times in my life where 
You know, a dirty little joke from like grade school can pop into my head for no reason. And why is that? Why is, you know, do I seem to lose the opportunity to remember, you know, some important details and this just foolishness just comes into my head and I can remember it like, you know, Rick Vecarello was telling me that day, you know. Sorry, Rick. Where are you? Um, okay, back to God's word here. Oh, just one more thought too. You know, it talks about uh, the gospel and and um, maybe your uh, your version, your text, you know, talks about uh, being led astray from the sincere and pure devotion of Christ. Maybe it says, you know, that's back in verse 3. Maybe it's the simple gospel as it's said in there. But the power of the gospel. Here's a thought. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and he says, I promised you, I betrothed you to one husband. Paul being the father, he says, as a pure virgin to Christ. Okay, now... If you were having your reputation on the line, if you were saying, I'm your father and taking any kind of group, would it be the church in Corinth that you would say, I'm presenting you as a pure virgin to Christ? I wouldn't do it. I'd be looking for, you know, churches got it a little bit more together than, than the church in Corinth has shown. But that's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the word to be able to take and wash and make us spotless and, and present, uh, be able to present us as that virgin bride to Christ. Okay, verse 5 and, and 6. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior, inferior to these super apostles. Woo! Even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Super apostles, he calls these um, guys. And uh, can you imagine the gall as far as being an individual to say I'm an apostle? You know, during that time. But that was their claim to the, the church in Corinth. And uh, here, these men that were, were coming in, they were trying to mix law with grace. Um, their efforts were really not to glorify God at all, but to gain converts for themselves. You know, and uh, so when you, you, you take a look at uh, the whole bride-husband type situation, they were just looking to grab hold of, of those to be followers for them. And, um, you know, uh, Paul mentions here, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. I, you know, I, I look at Paul being unskilled in speaking. Look at the body of work, you know, that, that he's written here. You know, go back to Acts as far as him... Uh, going to Mars Hills and, uh, and, and saying to, you know, the Greeks there as far as, hey, I recognize you guys are, are very religious, you know, while I'm walking around your city, I see you got a, a, an idol to the unknown God. Well, I know the unknown God and I'm here to tell you. And I'm thinking, stupendous, that's wonderful, you know, to be able to get in and use their culture and glorify God and explain the one true God to them, I wouldn't say that uh, he's an inferior um, speaker, but I'm also not going to call Paul a liar. So it, that hadn't, again, it's another kind of late in the, in the study of this as far as, so Paul is saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm not so skilled in speaking but I'm, it's not that way in the knowledge that I had. You know, if Paul, the apostle, can say he doesn't possess all these gifts, 
you know, sometimes I think that maybe we can get caught in the trap of, we have a, a pastor who's very skilled in uh, reading God's word and being able to explain it in a way that, you know, we understand and not only understand, but moves us and, and, and causes us to, you know, search inside and cry out and change and, and, but sometimes we assume he can do it all. He can do the administrative, he can do the serving, he can do the visiting, he can do the, you know. But that's the beauty of our body here. Um, I can tell you uh, on the elders board that uh, it, it truly is a blessing, uh, the group that uh, God has brought together, because those, uh, those skills have come out not just in, in the elders, but their wives. And I also, I see it in our body. We got gift of hospitality. We got the gift of financial, you know, uh, just the, the understanding. We got the gift of, of the artistic multimedia. We got the gifts of worship, you know, of singing and bringing in a song. We have the gift of people who are technologically savvy and able to you know share that we have the gift of people who are doers they're pulling the tables out and they're putting them back and and doing chairs we have the the gift of people who are transporting those who need a ride and the list goes on and on and on and let me just echo paul as far as you know what can i say just keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and if you, you're not doing, then just tap one of the elders on the shoulder and say, hey, what can I be doing? And, and though we, I may not have an answer or they may not have an answer for you today, you know, there's a heart, a willing heart that's becoming evident and there is something the Lord will provide. Should I bring, step back just a tad? Yeah, let me try so, again, it's a beautiful, blessed thing. Um, the, the gifts, the coming together, the working as a body, not just talking about it, but doing it. And uh, by Paul's you know, own confession, he can't even do it all. All right, verses 7 through 9. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will remain from burdening you in any way. So... You know, Acts 18, I, I just love, you know, reading the different, different parts. If you went in Acts 18, you'd read about Paul arriving in Corinth and true to his method, he would hit the synagogue, you know, and he would begin sharing with the Jews there. And it mentions he met Priscilla and Aquila and they were tent makers by trade. He moved in with them. He's working with them, and that's how he's making his living. And it wasn't until Timothy and Silas came from Macedonia that he started uh, uh, preaching full-time as far as the tent making um, to be able to go in full ministry in Corinth. All right, so this whole robbed thing that he, he mentioned, um, he wasn't robbing. You know, it, it, it says in Macedonia, they, you know, the, that area there, they were eager to be able to contribute. They weren't a wealthy, you know, section there, um, by no means in comparison to Corinth, but they wanted to give. They were determined, to, they, were, they were asking that they could give, and they brought a gift to him. And so he, it provided his needs. And so in full-time ministry there, Paul recognizes that this is a stumbling stone um, for the people in Corinth. The detractors that came in, they came in and they were receiving money from the church in Corinth. And um, 
we'll see that here. Uh, as the truth of Christ in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Acadia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows that I do. And what, am I do, and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasting in, missionary, in mission, they work on the same terms as we do. And they work in the same terms as they do. He's basically saying, I'm not receiving money. Throw that out to your super apostles and see how that flies with them. You know, take away the funding. Oh, and by the way, I don't work where anybody has worked before. I'm always pushing. I'm seeking to go out where the gospel hasn't been shared. What are they doing? They're coming in where the gospel has already been shared and they're undermining. They're looking again to just uh, work for themselves rather than work for the, the glory of God and the good of his people. Verse 13, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Uh, so they, he, in, he was calling them super apostles. He's, he's calling it out in truth. They're, they're pseudo apostles. They're not true apostles. False apostles. Um, and he talks about them disguising themselves as being of Christ. He continues on here with disguises. Verse 14, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 15, So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. You know, sometimes I think that uh, we forget that uh, um, Satan being a uh, created being, he was beautiful. He is beautiful. He's described as an angel of light, and we've kind of, you know, put him as this guy in a red suit with horns and a tail. And, uh, and uh, Satan probably takes great delight in that because uh, when he, you know, appears, he's, he's not recognized as who he truly is and uh, has the opportunity to deceive. So he's saying that uh, those disguises, the apostles, the false apostles disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, their end will correspond to their deeds. What a sentence. So what's the purpose of this section? I think there, again, uh, there's a reoccurring theme of uh, self-examination and prayer. You know, that uh, it's, it's easy to be able to, to go out and point, you know, outside as far as, well, you know, they got it wrong or, you know, they're... Uh, you know, that's not how they should be handling things. Don't they know, you know, how they should be, a brother wrongs them, what, what should they be doing? You know, they should be going to the brother. It's easy to, to be able to point out, uh, you know, all those things, but uh, we need to be focused on ourselves and, and in prayer. I think also guarding our minds and our hearts that, again, we're just, uh, if we're open to everything that the world has to be able to pour upon us, um, I think that you're kind of trying to do damage control after the fact. So setting your mind in advance, as far as I'm not going there, can save you a whole bunch of heartache. And, uh, and that's at any age, you know, is good advice. Um, again, the... The mind is just uh, a, a, a beautiful blessing, a gift, and it can also be, um, be a burden. And uh, it's a matter of training that mind, disciplining it, you know, um, what it receives and what do you do with something that doesn't quite fit. And how do you determine what fits? That's the last part in the purpose here. It's being in God's word. 
That gives you the opportunity. It gives you the baseline. It gives you the cornerstone to be able to examine yourself, not against one another. We were cautioned against that, you know, last week. Be examining yourself against God's word. Um, May we be as the Bereans. Take what you've heard and go to God's word and and compare it to it. Um, That's all I have for you today. Let me close us in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for the simple gospel. Lord, how powerful it is. It has the, the ability to change lives at any age. It's understandable by the youngest to the oldest. And forgive us, Lord, when we, we complicate it. Lord, there's, there's a depth and there's a richness and there's um, wisdom that goes beyond our own capabilities. But let us not get hung up in the things that we can't understand and let's focus on the things that are revealed to us in your word and continue to go through your word and be washed and cleansed, um, corrected, encouraged, condemned, comforted. Just your word has the ability to to do all that. And Lord... uh, May we be known as, as a church that uh, loves your word, that um, studies your word, that is not easily accepting of, of any kind of gospel that may present itself, of any spirit, Lord, of any other Jesus. Lord, may our eyes be fixed upon you. We love you. Our desire, Lord, is to love you more and more every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.